Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the, what, what do we call this one? The Child Trauma Webinar. As you know, this past week has been a very trying one. We've all been watching uh, the Newtown Sandy Hill, is this Sandy Hill? Sandy Hook um, tragedy. And I know our children are probably having lots of questions, even if they're not saying anything. And today, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, how to address the children, whether in the classroom or, or parents, how they can address children when they have questions. And um, so we want to give you uh, some language, some ways of dealing with what has happened. Even though it's not here in Chicago, um, but it's on TV 24-7. So we have today uh, with us uh, Marlita White, and many of you probably already know her um, because she c comes to us from Chicago Safe Start, Children Exposed to Violence. And um, so we've been working with her for a while. And we also have Mary Reynolds from Castle Central. Um, and you might want to talk a little bit about yourself, uh, both about yourself. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they will be your presenters today. And, and hopefully we'll have some questions and answers, uh, question and answer period that you can um, you know, ask anything that you like. Uh, we have in the room also <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Commissioner Vanessa Rich, who wants to say a word really to you. <laughs> in the corner. Um, I want to thank everyone for taking the time, and especially our two guests, because obviously this was a quick turnaround. Um, and uh, I don't know about everybody out there, but honestly, I can't think about it without crying. And um, so I know that whether or not our kids know what's going on, it's affected us all so much that we really need all of us to figure out good coping skills and what we need to do. And uh, even standing here right now, I really want to cry again. So uh, I appreciate your taking the time. I truly appreciate our experts and providers uh, who care for our children all the time. And I guess the other thing I would say about all of this is that this is what we need to be paying attention to anyway. Our children are exposed to trauma every single day. And so the things that we learned here today uh, will help us get through this, but also are things that you just need, all of us need, to incorporate into our business. So I want to thank everyone again. We have a couple of our staff people who are here besides our trusty Victor, who uh, is our, our video producer guru. Uh, and uh, also in the room we have... Hi, <laughs> The Okay, and I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Paula. I, actually, I want to um, turn this over to our presenters, and um, and if you like to say something about yourself, about what you're doing today, and um, just give the presentation. Great. Well, um, I want to thank everyone from DFSS, and actually, um, all three of you all are um, kind of frequent flyers with us at our um, Chicago State Star Advisory Board meeting, and so we definitely felt. Um, that we needed to move, whatever we needed to move to be able to be here and respond, that is exactly what we're here for. So I definitely appreciate being able to be here. And to my friend Mary Reynolds, who um, did do even more shifting to uh, really make room for us today. So I definitely appreciate Mary being here. Um, I'm not that interesting, but Mary actually comes <laughs> with... <laughs> you don't need to hear about that. <laughs> but um, Mary actually comes with a lot of experience because she is a direct service provider, um, but also has been able to participate in lots of the learning communities that have emerged in Chicago um, to respond to child trauma. And so maybe, Mary, if you'll do, do a soft introduction to yourself now, but I think when we get to the resource piece, you probably can even speak more about your personal um, knowledge of some of those um, different activities and, and how people can look forward to being able to um, uh, interact with those learning communities even moving forward. Uh, <laughs> well, so I'm also very glad and grateful to be here. Um, when Marlita told me this was happening, I had I was 
glad, right, to hear that we're responding and that we're thinking about even the youngest of children and how this may be affecting them. Um, and maybe most importantly, how it may be affecting us in our work with one another and with children and families when, as everyone has said, we feel so overwhelmed and scared and sad and devastated by what has happened. And so um, I'm glad and happy to be here. As Marlita said, I work um, with one of the Chicago Safe Start sites as a direct service provider for children ages five and under who've been exposed to violence. Um, and as such, work really closely with the Head Start in child care and early childhood learning communities and always find that you guys are such a place of safety and such a resource for children and families. And so during this time, I'm glad to be here so that we can provide you with additional information and support and resources um, as you move forward in continuing to support these kids and families. And I wonder, Victor, if we can do a sound check just to see, are they able to respond either in typing to tell us if they can hear us? OK? Yeah, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. If they have questions, they can type it in the question box. And if they have a message, they can type it in the chat. Or if they can raise their hand, they can go ahead and raise their hand. Our folks are pretty uh, well versed in webinars, so if they can have a question, they'll ask it. OK, great. <laughs> I'm not there. <laughs> this is a great equalizer. So um, as I understand, we have about an hour. And so we're going to go ahead and dive into the material so that we do have sufficient time for questions. Um, the way that we really approached the presentation was, and Mary and I talked about this, you know, so we pulled materials and we thought about how to really reference the context in terms of the shooting. And we just thought, you know what, we're already on overload. You know, so it's that 911 effect already, so or 9/11 that we we just don't need more pictures. We we're sufficiently sensitized, and we're even overwhelmed. And so what we thought we would do is to really uh, approach this presentation so that you have enough information to certainly address the issue at hand. But as Paulette said, these are and, and Vanessa, these are materials and these are conversations that we want to have all the time. And Chicago is positioning itself. So that we are ready to respond. And that is the approach that we took. And I think you'll find that as we go through the conversation, that we will touch down into specifics. But then we also want to give you enough that you can feel like you are a proactive responder, or, or you're able to re respond proactively and not just um, after, the, after the fact. So um, if we can go ahead, unless you guys have questions, great. Any questions, Victor? I can't really see the <laughs> So um, what we want to do um, through the conversation is to make sure that we sufficiently define violence and trauma. We always find that people don't really have a good definition of violence, even though we experience it all the time. And if we leave it at that, then we're never really going to do anything about it. So we do offer a working definition of violence, a definition of trauma. We want to make sure that we're advancing in our kind of communal understanding of these terms. Um, make sure that we're spending time talking about some short-term and long-term effects, and then give you some real resources um, moving forward. So in terms of violence, if you go to slide three, um, we're really just talking about this intentional use of physical force or power, this, you know, this, the looming threat of force. Uh, and it can touch down whether it's physical, emotional. Uh, sometimes when people think physical, they may not think sexual. But it's all of those different ways that we can walk away from an exchange where we feel threatened. That threat might happen as an, inter an interaction between individuals. This can certainly happen um, between uh, one person and large groups, as we certainly know, in this particular situation. Um, and then when we move forward to our next slide of four, I believe, we're talking about um, exposure to violence. Next. Great. OK, we got it. <laughs> um, and we're talking about children may be exposed to violence, whether they are the direct victim of certain kinds of um, violent activity or if they're a witness. And so when we talk from our project's perspective with Chicago State Start, we have a very big front door for what exposure to violence means. So that means that if there's domestic violence happening in the family and the child is there, if there's violence happening, um, between the sibship, um, maybe the parent is abusive to the child, or maybe another child in that sibship. That meets that definition of exposure. And also, certainly, when violence is happening in the community, and from our perspective, we are in a global community, and so we're still 
well within our uh, exposure to violence framework. And then if we go to the next slide, we're talking about trauma. So then trauma then gives us this kind of way to zero in on what that particular experience is. It could be the one experience, or it's an acute or profound experience, such as the one we have in the news right now. But it can also be a chronic experience, someone who every Friday they know something's going to happen at their home. So, but these are things in terms of experiences that feel powerful, they feel overwhelming, they feel out of control, and very, very dangerous. And the result is that a person's capacity to cope with it is dramatically overrun. Um, and when you're thinking about a very young child, the younger that child is, the more easily they're overwhelmed. And so then when we're talking about traumatic events, we've already kind of referenced those things, domestic violence, community violence, terrorism, war, mass events that we're experiencing now, child abuse, natural disasters, and even life-threatening medical emergencies. Um, and because we do want to make the case that while we're talking about our communal and our shared experience with this particular shooting, that for a very young child, uh, if their mother is crying, that's a catastrophe. You know, so you have to shift that context the younger the child gets. So sometimes people might be of the frame of mind to dismiss an event. Well, because it was a small-scale event, it was just two people. Um, but for a young child, that's all the world is, okay? And then um, we, lastly, as we're still trying to get our frame together, we always encourage people as you're trying to assess what um, has happened, what the young person knows about, uh, we want you to think about and to engage the young person or people around that, that child. What did they see? What did they hear? What did they learn about? So we're talking about whether the child was in the room when it happened or not, if they were in the house when it happened or not, if they were in the car when it happened or not. Um, if we're talking about on television, uh, which Mary makes that point and we'll, talk, we'll revisit it again, that whenever it's showing on TV for a very young child, it's happening right now. So that means every single time they show it on television, it's happening again. So we do have some cautions. We have materials that you'll um, have a chance to glance at in this presentation, but you'll have some walkaways. And one of the tips that they offer in the materials really is to try to gatekeep how often and how much um, the child is exposed even to the replay on television. And then the last piece before we leave this slide, we really want to talk about Beyond the questions about what the child has seen and what they know and what they've heard, who else needs some attention? Because we have to deal with this issue of vicarious traumatization. All of us in the room who were nodding, as Vanessa said, she wanted to cry just in reference to the event, we're all a party to that. So as we as a community are better prepared to respond to the young people um, in our charge, we also have to keep um, an eye on how we prepare ourselves to deal with the person to our left and to our right. And then lastly, we want to talk about this National Safe Start Survey. I don't think we need to convince anyone in Chicago that violence is an issue, right? <laughs> We're all agreeing. I'm sure you're all nodding your heads right now. But um, what is important about this survey is that we are witnessing, the within the last 10 years, the, a major movement, and we should not discount that that this country, when 9-11 happened, we did not have the resources we have now. We were not prepared at the level we are prepared now to get materials in the hands of, of caregivers and families. We have far more responders that are prepared. We are much further along than we were before. Now we have to keep addressing the event and stop film. But we are not as vulnerable as a community as we were. And so I think we need to understand that in terms of protective factors so that we don't spin out of control because we feel like we're so vulnerable. As a community, we are much better positioned. And the Safe Start Survey is simply there so that you can understand that the national resources, our federal partners, are actually trying to align themselves and ask this answer important question that will direct resources. How many children are exposed to violence? And what kinds of violence? And um, before this survey, we couldn't even answer that question. We couldn't hazard a decent guess. And so this is just there to give you a sense that we do have federal partners that are trying to better position themselves to understand the scope of the issue and the levels of responses and resources that we need to bring to bear.
So <laughs> we were working something out. <laughs> um, so let's go to the next slide and talk about risk and protective factors. Um, when we have more time, we have this um, a longer conversation about risk factors, and we go through at the community level what are risk factors at the cultural level, which is more macro, all the way down to it within the family context or maybe for this conversation within your site, which actually would reside at the community level, um, risk factors, right? But then um, what is interesting and what we enjoy doing is then going to the next slide. You don't have to move, Victor, uh, because I've integrated the two slides. And that protective factors exist on those same levels. And the learning opportunity is that people sometimes feel like I can't control what is happening at a cultural level. I can only control what's happening in my family. We have it on that slide because we do, in fact, control that. We are a party and a participant in that conversation. What you do on Facebook, what movies you go and see at the theater, what you bring into your home, those are things that dictate our larger culture. And the degree to which you see yourself as being involved in your community really does dictate the level of risk factors that are residing um, or protective factors. The more involved we are in our communities, we are enhancing our capacity to be a protective factor, period. And then lastly, I'll say that within a family situation, and all of us, especially if you're working in centers or working with families, um, we are um, sometimes people say dysfunctional and all these kind of things. We are just who we are walking in the front door. And um, so families who have issues where there's um, maybe underemployment or under unemployment where poverty is present, where people feel very isolated, where there may be um, illness in the household, um, and certainly if people don't feel like they can't communicate, maybe there's a language barrier or and other things that keep families out of community, those are risk factors. And the more families are connected to resources to one another, those are protective factors. The more people feel that they can ask a question and get that question answered, we're moving in the right direction. Anything about that? <laughs> no. Great. And then, um, so then I'll change over to Mary. <laughs> Yay! Um, talk more about um, what do we know about the differential response to exposure to violence. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as you guys know, if you um, have children who come from the same family or you're raising multiple children, every kiddo is different and everyone is going to respond differently um, to situations like this, to violence exposure, to trauma. Um, and there are some factors that can contribute to that, such as age. So when we're talking about age and how that can impact a child's response, um, you all are working with young children who have sort of fewer cognitive skills and less life experience to draw on to help them make sense of, of what's going on around them. And I think if we as grown-ups are struggling to make sense of what is going on around us, we can imagine that it's been exceptionally confusing for, for small children who don't have the years of, of experience that we have. So um, age is certainly going to impact a child's exposure um, response. Younger children may be more vulnerable, but then we see older children who are equally impacted just in different ways and with different coping resources. Uh, when we talk about gender as it relates to, um, to exposure to violence and factors that can impact children, um, really what we're thinking about is a lot of social messaging that our kids get around what's an appropriate response for a boy, what's an appropriate response for a girl. Um, are girls allowed to cry about something? Are boys allowed to cry? Who's allowed to be scared? Who's allowed to act out aggressively and violently? Or who's expected to act out aggressively and violently? Um, and so we just may notice, again, some children reacting differently based on some of the social messages they've got about gender. Familiarity is really talking about how familiar the children are with either the victim or the perpetrator of the violence. Um, but in this case, one thing that we're seeing with the elementary school students is that those kids look so much like the children that we work with, right? They're, they're small. They're young. They like the same games and toys. They have the same kind of moms and dads. And so although they're strangers, the children, at least that I've worked with over the past <laughs> 24 hours, have really um, been touched by that. Even though they don't know the children, they feel familiar. They feel like peers. Um, frequency, we sort of think about how often violence exposure is occurring. Um, is it a daily occurrence? 
in which case maybe some kids sort of build up that tough exterior where it doesn't look like it gets to them. Um, or maybe they're so raw from how frequent the violent happens, violence happens that, that they're impacted in that way. Um, one other thing to consider, frequency of violence exposure, is also what led up to this point of the shootings in Connecticut, right? And so what level of exposure, how frequently have the children that you're working with been exposed to violence prior to this? Because that can certainly impact how they respond today. Um, severity, we talk about um, in terms of how severe the violence is. I think an important point to make there is that that's really subjective, right? So for me, seeing someone hit is really, I'm, it's severe, it scares me, it frightens me, um, and it's not okay with me, right? So I have G-rated movies <laughs> in my house, and my husband, who's in law enforcement, has the other end of the spectrum. And, um, and so that's a subjective experience. So what might look to us as not severe, not that serious, not a big deal, may be to some of the children we're working with really quite terrifying. Um, and the final one is proximity, as in how close was the child to the violence as it was happening. Um, in our day and age of immediate media access, proximity really has shifted, right? So it used to be, were you in the same room or were you in the basement? And now it's, how close were you sitting to the television as the immediate news came pouring in? For our young children, um, Connecticut is a mystical place, right? It could be three blocks away for all they know meaning proximity looks and feels very different for young children um, versus how it might look or feel for older children, grown-ups, who you can show on a map this is where it happened, see it's far away, the people are not close. For young children, that, that sense of time and space and location is just not yet developed. And so proximity feels like it's happening right here, right now, and all of us are at risk. And I think to an extent, because of how much we've really been hammered with this story in the media, this feels very close to all of us, right? Connecticut doesn't at all feel like it's on the other side of the country. It feels like it's right here um, and very present for all of us. Keep going? Sure. So another thing that we think about um, in terms of how children are impact, impacted by violence is about brain development, which is honestly another whole like several days that we would need to spend together to talk about this. Um, so mark your calendars. We'll find a time, right? Um, but things that we know are that experiences with violence and trauma can impact how children's brains develop, um, can cause brains to develop sort of abnormal neural networks and abnormal gene functioning that build these connections in our brains that are way less functional for us and allow way less space in our brain for more functional capacities like problem solving, dealing with feelings. Um, abstract reasoning, sitting on a circle, sitting on a yeah, yeah. um, calculus, <laughs> et cetera, right? Um, so that's something that is important to remember. And again, because our children come to us with however many years of experience prior to this current um, experience of violence and trauma, um, we don't know necessarily what impact has already happened for them um, and how this then may be reinforcing some of those abnormal networks or some of those more less functional ways that their brain is, is coping and is, is directing resources. So um, Zero to Three has some great resources on brain development, um, but an important thing to note is that although the first three years of life are really important, um, that's a constant process, right, fortunately, so that we as grown-ups can learn new things <laughs> um, or at least try to learn new things. and so that even if our children come to us very deeply impacted by previous experiences with violence and trauma, that we still have opportunities to really turn that around, no matter what the age of the child may be. And so what we're going to do is to give you a sense of different kinds of effects that you might witness um, operating with the young people that you're, that you're caring for. So we've broken them out, and we're going to start with cognitive, and we're going to kind of move through. So you have in your slides way more than we're going to talk about, but we, again, left it there because we want you to have a resource to come back to. So to start with, is that okay with you all? <laughs> okay. We didn't check in with them. We just decided. <laughs> we made an executive decision. <laughs> so 
let's think about cognitive effects. So when we talk about cognition, we're really talking about how, back to what Mary said, how we make these decisions that executive functions. So one of the things that um, how, your, how your brain um, decides who is at fault. So blaming others is at the top of that list, right? We see that happening as we are discussing this situation, the Newton shooting, on the news. People are deciding who's at fault, why this happened. But this is what happens in the life of a young person, certainly when they're in distress all the time. They go to blame first, and the first person they typically blame is themselves. Even if they weren't in the room, they had nothing to do with it, it kind of comes back to them because they're so small and so young that they really are the center of the universe for themselves. Um, also, what you might see is a young person who doesn't feel like they can trust anyone. They don't um, have faith that people will take care of them because the world has proven to be out of control and very threatening. Um, you may also see young people resorting to these rigid stereotypes. Um, Mary's already talked about how we reinforce that in our social messaging, but we really might see it pronounced when we get to the point of how the child's brain is operated and how their brain um, and their conditioning, social conditioning, has dictated their response. They're going to do it like a man. They're going to express their behavior the way a man should do that, and they may resist your efforts to get them to cry or to maybe be softer. So you may get into conflict because of that. And it's good to know that that, that may present itself in more pronounced ways. Um, if we think about emotional effects, certainly um, children, going back to that blaming, they're going to feel guilty for um, any of that abuse. People are feeling guilty uh, about this particular incident, but all the time when there is a dramatic event, children always feel guilty. They always feel like, I should have done something. Sometimes they're doing and saying what the adults around them have said, but other times they really are um, feeling these things. Um, they may be very angry about the violence and chaos in their lives, and you as a provider and as a caregiver, even as a parent, may be afraid of that moment when they ask, why did this happen? And why does this keep happening? My niece just said, I think it's time for us to move out of Chicago. It's too many bad things happening. Because last week they were at church and a person was shot outside of the church and was laying under their car, in fact. Um, and then this shooting happens. And so she's very stimulated by the violence that's happening right now. And I think that certainly other children are feeling that. Um, I think that many of us as adults are feeling those things. We feel overwhelmed. And if you can't find a place to get that um, emotion out, then that's a constant state of being depressed and overwhelmed and powerless. And so some of the things that we began to do and we'll offer some suggestions really can help that person, a young person, feel less powerless. Right? And that is our goal. How can we create some structure around them in the moment where they feel most out of control so that they can feel that that control is being restored? Um, in terms of social effects, let's think about um, how young people, perhaps before an incident, maybe they were very um, friendly, um, maybe they really were on target with their assignments in school or, or they followed directions. But then after an event happens that can really disturb them, they really might have different behaviors that are manifesting. Maybe they become um, very aggressive in school. Maybe you start to see some of those acting out behaviors that Mary talked about um, for anger management. If you are overwhelmed with the fight or flight situation and you're wondering who's about to shoot me, you really might not care that your instructor wants you to sit down. You know, so in terms of wh where you're prioritizing, um, the priority in terms of following instruction may fall very far down the, on the um, ladder. And so some of these um, negative interactions between instructor and student might start to emerge. Um, and when we're thinking about younger children, um, 
and moving into maybe backwards into infancy, perhaps you don't see some of these social effects. Um, but we do want to underscore that even infants are communicating every single day. I don't really have to say that to you all because I know you know that. But again, we want to also create, as you're having this conversation with parents who have children that may be verbal, then you can still have this same conversation with parents with children who are not verbal yet, right? So because parents need to understand that when a child is tensing up, an infant is tensing up and avoiding eye contact and those kinds of things, that's a child who's communicating, I don't feel safe, I don't feel connected, I don't feel bonded. Um, and so some of these same things, how to create a nurturing experience and environment, still apply even though we're talking about an, a, very, a very young child. And then in terms of physical effects. So here's the child who is stressed out and now they don't want to go to school and they say, my stomach hurts or my head hurts or whatever those um, kind of vague symptoms may be. We have this here because we think that if parents don't know that children who are under stress, who've been recently traumatized, will resort to some of these kinds of behaviors, then the parent may say, no, we're going to school, get this jacket on, let's get out of here. And that's not necessarily the most helpful response. Well, you still might need them to get the jacket on, and you still do need to go to daycare or whatever, but we want the parents to know that some of these behaviors are going to show up. And when they say they have a headache or they have a fever, and then you go to test that, and they, they have normal temperature, then we don't want you to feel frustrated. Or some people might mock them, oh, you just don't want to go. And we want people to understand and contextualize that some of these physical effects are, just, again, this is how children are communicating the distress that they're feeling. Um, the last piece I'll say about this is that their regression is a big deal here, and um, I've alluded to it. So, for example, if you're a parent and you have three stair-step children and you finally got this four-year-old to the point where they can't put their jacket on and maybe grab a bag and meet you at the door, um, after an event that's traumatizing, complex commands, get your jacket, go to the door, put your shoes on, that they maybe could do before, they may struggle with that. And that can be frustrating for a parent because you feel like they're not listening, they're being obstinate. But uh, so we want to underscore that sometimes confusion and regression shows up. So a child may feel a little younger than they really are for a little bit of time. And, and we want parents to go ahead and allow that and then coach them back up to their, so they're acting and behaving on age level. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, behavioral effects. Um, certainly we may see heightened sexualized and aggressive behavior, some withdrawal and avoiding behavior. If your child was already kind of quiet and they weren't super interactive, then this might not be where you see the difference. This, this whole slide is really about behaviors that you see after the event that weren't really there before. And as you see these, if you're going down the list and you're checking off things like, I see this in Sally, I see this in Sally, then these are ways for you to um, pay attention, to notice them, to start coaching the child, give them more support, more hugs, more face-to-face -face time. And if they're still holding on to that weeks and weeks and weeks after the fact, then you want to start thinking about, I need to get some other support, some more help in here because the child is not naturally rebounding from this event. And then lastly, family and interpersonal relationships um, that become strained, so this overachieving or underachieving. Um, so again, sometimes children have a way to put themselves in the middle of a, a stressful situation so that they become the focus of the stress because the other stress um, is too much for them or the family to deal with. So if parents are arguing, the child might do something to become the focus of the attention. Um, so at least they're, they're yelling at the child and not at one another. It's a strange way that we try to, and when we're very young, try to control um, behavior and make ourselves safe. We want to make sure as adults that we are on top, on top of these behavioral effects and that we're not going to um, have the most dramatic and most negative and most punitive response. Because if we can see behavioral roll rollback as kind of part and parcel of a traumatic response, then you're going to position yourself to be very supportive and helpful and, and helping that child, coaching that child back to the level of behavior that you expect. And you're not going to, uh, for example, 
suspend the child, uh, refuse to let them return, and things like that. If you really are not um, um, sensitive to what's happening, you might really feel like this child is just a behavior problem. They're lightning rods for conflict. I need to move them out of the setting. Yeah. So um, the next thing we really want to sort of think about and talk about is resiliency. And I think that's a, something that comes up pretty often, right? You can do one more slide. Um, around, we say it all the time, right, that children are so resilient. Oh, children are so marvelously resilient. And they totally are, right? That kids, and especially little ones we see, are just drawn toward healthiness and wellness and, and joy and all of those wonderful things that make even our really hard days at work fun sometimes, most of the time. <laughs> um, however, we also sort of talk about resiliency and resilience not as a trait that you have or don't have, but more as a state, right? And what is it about this child's life, this child's world, this child's experience, the people in this child's life that allow this child to be resilient? Or what is it about this child's experiences, this child's life, this child's um, social support network that make it difficult for this child to be resilient? And the same is true for us as grown-ups, right? So if we define resiliency as an ability to recover from or adjust to misfortune or change, and we think about our own lives as grown-ups, I know I'm more resilient when I've slept well and I've eaten and I can call my mom and, right, and all of those sort of factors are in place. And I'm less resilient when things in my life are already not going so well, right? And we know that the same is true for children. So when we think about some of your kiddos who seem less affected by this, um, then the factors are in place for them to be in a state of resiliency. And if you see your kiddos who are struggling a lot more, then the factors are maybe not in place for them to be as resilient right now. And the question becomes, what do we need to do to help move this child? Um, what do we need to put in place to help make that possible? So we thought about some strategies that support resilience. Um, one of those being, and we cannot emphasize this one enough, relationships. And I think we all say, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And one of them is just be there. Listening is doing. Showing up is doing. Um, being steady and stable and consistent is doing. And so. Um, those relationships that are healthy, that are supportive, are so, so, so important. Um, something else that we know that supports resilience is that primary caregiver model of care, so that if there are multiple teachers in the classroom, right, um, maybe each teacher sort of has a small group for whom they're a little bit more responsible. And that's part of that promoting healing relationships, that steady, stable, available, responsive caregiving is really, really important. Um, we know that young children, as well as older children and grown-ups, are able to be more resilient when they have a healthy social support network. And that is true for two-year-olds as much as it is for 37-year-olds, right? <laughs> um, not that I know, <laughs> but I've heard. And so what you can do in your classrooms to support young children in making friends and in having positive social relationships serves them in terms of recovering from trauma and violence, also serves them in preventing negative impacts from trauma and violence, and supports them in preventing trauma and violence in the first place. And so you're modeling how to make friends. You may be teaching directly. You may be buddying up kids when you see that they have um, complementary needs or challenges, <laughs> right? So that if you have one who's more naturally a caretaker and more naturally gregarious, that you can find a way to connect with someone who's a little bit more shy or slow to warm up that can be really helpful, especially for very young children. Um, the next thing that really does help support resilience is a safe environment, um, meaning that there's space in your, in your classroom, in your site, in your home, in your church, in your agency, wherever you are, where um, you can talk about feelings, you can have feelings, you can share how you're doing, you can listen, um, and children know that they're welcome there. And, you know, I've been to so many, probably many of your Head Start sites and just seen these gorgeous spaces where we know there are the children's pictures reflected and there's their work reflected and there's their mom and their dad and their dog reflected and that is so welcoming and that says, we want you here, we care about you here, you belong here and we're really going to do what we can to help you continue to feel that way to support that resilience in children. 
So then let's kind of go even further and think more about ways that you can help. So back to your physical environment. Um, is there a place if a child does present and they really are very visibly upset or you just want to have a semi-private conversation with them, is your face aligned so that you can do that easily? If some of the children that you're, that you're responding to and caring for have already been trained to keep secrets, um, meaning they're, they're from a family that says this is private, we don't talk about this with other people, um, then having private space becomes really a premium. And if they can hear you, kind of think about when you go to your doctor's office and they tell you to stand behind that line and then they yell at you from across the uh, waiting room, well, what are you here for? And you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> hey, let me get over there. Um, and so we want to do that same thing within the space um, that you are really managing so that so children can feel like they can unload and they don't have to be embarrassed. In the same way for the parents. We want to create this envir environment where parents can come in and say, I just don't know what to do. And if all of your space is an open floor plan, then that may not happen in that context. Certainly you want to be able to remain calm, and sometimes we have to be good actors. <laughs> so even if you, you don't feel calm, you want to look calm and pretend it until you just kind of fake it until you can get <laughs> to the next person. Um, you do want to stay honest with yourself. Um, we usually start our trainings when we have time, uh, more time than, than we have today, with a self-reflection. Um, so we're talking about how a young child is experiencing some of the violence that we're, um, hap that's happening now in the news and that we're seeing kind of play out in our um, city from day to day. But we know that we're dealing with the walking wounded when we look at a room full of adults. We are dealing with people who themselves have unaddressed pain in childhood, um, who don't feel like they can talk to someone, who don't feel valued. Uh, and so we want to make sure that even the parents who are coming into contact with you feel that you're a safe place for them. Um, definitely want to be able to read between the lines. We talk about, and I think we'll get to it a little later, that your job is to just be able to listen well. <laughs> so listen well. Um, and to show belief, I had an opportunity to talk with a woman who had been abused in her early childhood and told one person that person didn't believe her and she never told another person for about 35 years. And so we want to be able to be that person who will show belief. Again, if you don't believe them, you need to look like you do. <laughs> Even if you need to later say, well, let's see how much of this was really happened or how much they imagined, it doesn't matter. You want that child to walk away from that inter, um, interaction feeling valued and feeling like even if they stretched something, you care so much more about them than the actual story. Um, we want to be able to walk through the process. So for you and your site, if you are not clear about what to do in a crisis, this is an important time to start thinking about how can I get myself trained up, how do I change um, our rules and regulations so that we really do have a really good process so that if something happens, um, we know where, what, what to do, what's our first step, what's our second step, what are, what's our crisis plan. Um, another piece is to really, in terms of how to talk with the young person, you go to the next slide, we're thinking about Always eye to eye level, right? So most of us are much taller than the young people that we're caring for, and so that means you either got to bring them up or you got to come down. Um, so we want to have age appropriate conversations. So the younger they are, you got to bring break that language down. I certainly have um, many people in my life that are very very smart, much smarter than I am. Um, but they don't, you don't want to bring your PhD language to a very young child. So you got to talk about, oh, we don't necessarily, perhaps you don't need to talk about the shooting. You might want to say someone went into, you know, um, the school and they hurt someone. They hurt a lot of people. So sometimes what we as adults need to know about the details, we don't necessarily need to communicate that to the young person. We want to make those adjustments so that they can understand generally what happened, but they don't need to go home. You don't have to paint them a vivid picture, okay? 
Um, we have on here addressing confidentiality and its limits that doesn't necessarily apply to this, the shooting, but just imagine because trauma jumps. So you're crying right now because of the shooting. Next thing you know, you're crying because you miss your grandmother. And then maybe, you know, now you're thinking about, oh, this other bad thing happened to me. So if you're in a situation now the child is sensitized and now they want to talk about something that perhaps was off course of what you thought you were talking about. Now they're telling you about this other scary bad thing that happened. We just want people to be prepared that you don't want to overpromise confidentiality. So you don't want to say, you can tell me, I'll never tell. <laughs> you, what we want you to say is, um, certainly I am going to deal with whatever you tell me in the most appropriate way. Appropriate probably doesn't even apply in early childhood settings. <laughs> I'm going to do the right thing with what you tell me. Uh -huh. I'm going to only bring other people in who can help. You know, that's the kind of thing we want to do. So you don't want to overpromise because remember back on a previous slide, we don't have to go back, <laughs> that we said that <laughs> trust is broken down. And so if a child has already experienced a, a breaking of the trust, you don't want to give them more reasons not to trust you. And then the last piece I'll say on this slide is that if the child is not ready to go into ma massive detail about how they feel and, and what they're thinking, uh, it's kind of like talking to, okay, I won't say that. <laughs> but you know how you're, you're talking to the, the other person and you're like, how do you feel? And they're like, fine. Uh, well, what's going on? What, nothing. Okay, so it could be a teenager or a grown-up. So we want to do that same thing with a young, a young child. We want to back away from that. If they're not ready to talk, this is not the moment to prove that you can force them to communicate. You're going to communicate because I had this training, and we're going <laughs> to really understand each other. The goal is to let them know that I can come and talk to you whenever. That's the goal. Not that the exchange happens. The goal is that they know you are there. And if you establish that environment, then you've actually done what we want you to do. We sometimes say even sort of like when you get that sense that fine doesn't mean fine, to sort of say sometimes when we have, this is because I work with small children, right? Sometimes when we have big feelings, it's hard to talk about or think about them. If you want to, we can read a book together. And if you want to talk to me later, that's okay too, right? To just acknowledge what you see that might be there, um, to not close the door to that, but to also not push it. <laughs> And, some, and you're going to definitely want to coach parents. So if you're telling a parent, I noticed that Sally seemed upset, then you don't want to set the parent up to be in the car and say, what was going on? Uh, and then now the parent is doing something. So definitely we hope that you'll share that kind of um, guidance with the parent. That if they're not ready to talk, we don't want to force them to talk, and that just reinforces that I am even less powerful than I thought. Um, more things that you maybe want to um, avoid, Falling apart. Sometimes falling apart can tell you that there is an absence of supervision and training, right? Um, the goal is not that you're perfect, um, that you know exactly what to say, uh, but if you really don't know, I don't know the rules, I don't know what I should do. Uh, sometimes you may be confused and you really have had that training 19 times, but other times you just haven't ever been trained and you don't know the rule because there isn't a rule. And so the goal, again, in the midst of the crisis, when they're telling you that story, you don't want to fall apart. Fake it until you can get some more help uh, and just say, hmm, that, that's a lie. Okay. And then you just kind of go get someone else. But what you don't want to also do is to then avoid the child after they've overwhelmed you with information because they will sense that you are walking out of the room every time they walk in the room. Right? So you want to make sure that you don't start avoiding them. And um, also, you don't want to deflect. So if you say you're in charge of the classroom or the setting, but then because the situation is so overwhelming, you just want someone else to handle it, um, that's deflecting. So even if you're no longer able to make all of the decisions, sometimes your presence can be very powerful. You don't have to be saying anything. You don't have to keep dictating the next course of events, but you're just there, right? You did not run away from the situation. But I'll tell you, push come to shove, if you really do need to get out of there because it's triggering too much for you, then just make a graceful exit. <laughs>
Um, what we also included um, is this notion of ACEs, and we just don't want to ever leave a conversation about exposure to violence and not at least introduce ACEs. So how many of you have heard about the Average Childhood Experiences serve, um, <laughs> study? So you don't have to actually raise your hand, but <laughs> you can nod from where you are. <laughs> we'll feel it. Right? right, we will feel it. We will sense it because we're trained and we're very sensitive. <laughs> um, so the average childhood experiences and how it is relevant to this work is that this is a study that was done more than 20 years ago and the work has, is evolving and expanding even now that started off looking at you know, why people were able to successfully lose weight or not successfully lose weight in an obesity clinic in San Diego, California. Um, but what we learned from that and after more than 17,000 interviews with people um, over more than 20 years is that if you can isolate about 8 to 10 different issues that happen in the life of a child between 0 and 18, and if those things are present and they keep loading up, so you lost a parent to incarceration, you suffered the death of a caregiver in early childhood, you suffered sexual abuse and violation. So if you start accumulating certain categories of violations in early childhood, then which are considered these adverse childhood experiences, then a person might be on a collision course with certain kinds of other things. And if you look at that pyramid going upwards, it includes certain levels of impairment in terms of our social, emotional, and cognitive functioning, um, moving past um, how we adopt health behaviors or behaviors that really place challenges in our adult health, all the way through to early death. So the work that you're doing with these young people on a day-to-day -day basis um, where you are right there in the middle and in the mix with them when they are crying about this bad thing that happened, you can be changing the trajectory for the rest of their life. So it is no small thing that you are on this call, you're getting yourself prepared and taking seriously the work that you're doing. Um, and even if you can then communicate some of this as you get more talking points about it to parents, um, these things are important, and so the walk, the notion of walking wounded, I made it, other people can survive it, we have to let that go. We need to be thriving and not just surviving, right? Do you want to do the last one? Um, local. Sure, so if you can go to the next slide, we just want to make you aware of some of the local resources. One is um, the Chicago Safe Start website, chicagosafestart.net. Um, which is full of great resources, as well as some of links and contact information that you'll also find in this in the slides. The other is um, called Bringing the Kids Back into Focus, which is a curriculum about child exposure to violence. So sort of more in depth of some of what we've looked at today um, that is available in both English and Spanish that Chicago Safe Start providers are able to come provide for staff, for parent meetings, um, and that sort of thing. And then later on in 2013, if you actually want to flip the slide, what? Awesome. So during Prevent Child Exposure to Violence Week, which is the third week of April every year. Um, so I cannot believe it's 2013. It's like the future, right? But so we're looking at April 15 through 19 of 2013. And one of the things that we'll be doing during that week is um, training others in the implementation of that bringing the kids back into focus curriculum so that we can really expand the reach um, and really sort of bring increased public awareness to prevent child exposure to violence. Um, so Prevent CEV Week, there are lots of ways that you can get involved. You can collaborate with um, the local Chicago Safe Start sites, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, you can hang posters. You can have special events. You can run training. You can do all kinds of things that show your support of this idea of prevention, right? So what do we do so that this never happens again um, at, at all of our settings? If you want to do one more slide, we have um, the local Safe Start Partners. And there are four of us sort of housed across different parts of the city. Um, Metro down on the far south side out of their Calumet site, Family Focus Inglewood. Um, Asa Casa Central, and then Heartland Human Care Services. Um, and each of those sites has 
several resources for you. One is outreach and training um, for parents as well as professionals around child exposure to violence with a special focus on early childhood. One is um, community coalitions or councils made up of service partners, which might include you guys, um, who come together sort of at the local level to, to look at resources and what can we do in our community to prevent child exposure to violence. And the third piece of each of our four sites is the direct service piece, which offers um, counseling and therapy and case management services to kids and their families who've been exposed to violence. Um, the next slide has some additional resources in um, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Something of Administration Health. <laughs> SAMHSA. Nailed it. <laughs> um, has this Disaster Distress Helpline that's available 24 hours a day and is multilingual. You can also text that. That's a great resource for us as staff, for parents, for anyone who's just really feeling overwhelmed by this and needs some help and support. Um, in addition to the Chicago Safe Start site, there are other child-serving organizations and agencies, including the La Robita Child Trauma Center, the Urban Youth Trauma Center out of UIC, and then resources that you can find at the National Safe Start Center or the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, all of which have great resources. Um, and let me also underscore that the Urban Youth Trauma Center as well as La Vida oftentimes are available um, if you want to bring someone in to do training or if you want someone to come in and work with your staff over time because you're trying to become a trauma-informed site. So those are programs that can really kind of coach you through that um, longer process. Uh, we include information about Chicago Safe Start just because we always want you to know that there is room for you at our table, whether it's our advisory board that meets three times a year or our, our various community partners that Mary uh, already walked through with you. Um, and then we include um, in this presentation different ways you can also um, get in touch and uh, contact us and communicate with us um, if you go to the last slide at the health department. And um, let me, before I think we have one minute left, want to make sure that you know about these great, great resources that Mary pulled for us um, that are available both in English and Spanish that include uh, tips for parents and teachers uh, talking about violence and really addressing um, how do you help a young child cope in the face of a national tragedy. And so these are great user-friendly tips. You can think about um, not just reading them once and you know, figuring out is the checklist, did I do that, did I do that, but also you might want to think about how you might integrate some of these things that all adults should know, for example, on one of the tip sheets, how you might bring that into your staff meeting once a week. You know, what are we doing, what do we do this week that um, lifted off the page some of these really good tips. So we want you to really look at these resources. Again, the other materials that you can find on the online, like at the National Safe Start Center and the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, they are user-friendly and designed with you in mind. So we'll stop and see if you all have questions. I know that we're close to the end. Mm -hmm. If we don't have an opportunity to answer all of your questions, if you have written them down, we will respond in writing and get that back to Paulette so that she can share that with you. And so I'll stop talking and turn it <laughs> over to Paulette. Pardon? <laughs> I was just, just looking at him. Do we have questions there, Victor? Um, while we wait, um, I, 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 had, I spoke with my daughter today. Uh, my, my granddaughter's four. And so I was asking her, are you allowing her to watch TV and watch the, um, the, all the repetitive um, newscasts on this shooting? And she said, well, the initial, she saw the initial um, news thing. But what she saw were the law enforcement people. Mm -hmm. And she said to her, and she said, Mommy, I don't think, uh, I don't like what the people of the law, what the people of the law are doing because they have all those guns. So, and that's scary. So for her, the law enforcement people are supposed to be the good people, but scary to her. And um, so that's I mean, a great and, example of yeah. how what, you can't assume that a young child will make the same sense of things right. like you would. Right, right. And, and how 
how powerful it can be to follow a child's lead. So to say, tell me what you know and tell me what you're wondering and worrying about because that can be a great way to figure out what misconceptions they may have. You know, little ones will do whatever it takes to make sense of a situation, even if it looks way illogical, right? right. And so um, our role can sometimes be clarifying those right. misconceptions. Absolutely. Okay. Nobody no questions? questions? No hands, no hands up? up. <laughs> the end of the day. It is. The end. It's probably a very long day. I know this has probably weighed very heavily for all of us and, and just thinking about um, the kids and families that we're working with and what they've already brought with them up to this point at which um, the shootings in Connecticut happened. It's just heavy. So to acknowledge that and acknowledge that a really important thing for you guys to do is take good care of yourselves. I no, I have had to limit my media exposure just because I get obsessed. I just can't stop looking, and it's not helping me, right? And so to make sure that you're doing what you need to do to get sleep, um, healthy food slash chocolate, <laughs> which is totally healthy, y'all. You heard it here first. And also, let me just say that one thing that you'll find in the tip sheet uh, they make a reference to um, helping, kind of helping from where the child is, or child size help, or some reference like that. And it's such a wonderful idea because, you know, uh, a young person is thinking, oh, this is terrible, and their reflex is, I want to do something, uh, which should be all of our reflex. But um, maybe as a staff team, you could think about what are things that our center can do to really support. And so they offer suggestions like perhaps you can write letters to the school or you can maybe even write letters to the first responders or maybe we write letters to our local first responders or maybe we make cookies and take it to the area police station or the area fire department. But you know, so there are ways that we can express and help a young person um, express that need to help and that desire to help. Um, and then, again, they're feeling less powerless because they were able to put their hands on something that really made a difference for someone. It appears that a lot of the questions have to do with whether or not this is going to be available for people. <laughs> and, and Victor's typing in, yes, it will be. Uh, you'll have it posted by the end of the week. It'll be posted by the end of the week. And so, uh, Please let your staff know and sort of be there for them so you'll be able to, again, anything that you missed, anything you wanted to listen to again, uh, share with others, will be available for you. I don't know about everybody else, but I feel like I wanted to have a more you know, expanded <laughs> version of it. It was very fascinating for me. Um, I know I've heard some of this before, and but it's always um, um, you always provide such wonderful information that would be very useful on a day-to-day -day basis, not only at the site, but in your personal life. Absolutely applied as well. Yeah. So, um, well, we definitely okay. are looking for ambassadors, so people who can be trained to train others. Yeah. We have uh, no questions, but two comments. Very helpful webinar. <laughs> and thank you for providing this webinar with great well, and thank you guys, too, for the work that you do, right? This is not, uh, here's what we do, it's uh, right. here's what all of us do, right. and how powerful yeah. that is. There's this lovely thing floating around on the Facebook of Mr. Rogers talking about when he was a little boy mm -hmm. and scary things would happen, his mom always told him to look for the helpers, right? And look and see who's helping, and it reminds you that in spite of how awful particular incident is and how awful so many other things that have happened are, there are still so many people who really deeply care, who really want to make things better, who really want to support children and families. And I know for me that you guys are big time on that list. Of and, and I have one, I'm going to leave the room, but I have one, and I know we're about finished, and this is probably one of the things I think besides getting people, <laughs> our people, much more involved. I mean, Ms. Paulus said, we know that Many of our agencies have been involved in the work. Um, this gives us another opportunity uh, to step up. And as you said, you know, bake cookies, uh, sign a petition, uh, <laughs> um, 
you know, organize, to really look at those things that we need to do um, to put our children and, and, and do something about violence. And increase funding for mental health. Yeah. <laughs> so all those things that we talk about that we put on the back burner, the wellness conversations, the resilience activities, uh, this gives us a chance again to think about how important they are and to really put them on the front burner. Because like I said, we're, we're better prepared. We have the tools. Right. Um, and we really need to make sure that we, we use them. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. so, I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to again thank all of you and especially our guests. Okay. Have a wonderful holiday, everyone. Please be safe and be in contact with us if you need anything. Thank you. Thank you.